made this GoFundMe in support of our young friend, Georgia. Georgia was born in, on December 22nd, 1999. She was a beautiful, healthy baby girl. And about three weeks later, on her first outing from the house, she and her mom were in a tragic car accident. Unfortunately, her mom, Pam, did not survive the accident, and Georgia was severely injured. When she was five, John and Joe got together and eventually married. Josie adopted Georgia, and in fact, she's the only mom, really, that um, jo Georgia's ever known. Together for about seven years, John and Josie navigated the complex world of Georgia's medical needs and helped her grow and thrive in all the ways that she could until tragically John was killed in a sailing accident when Georgia was about 12. Georgia's seizure disorder uh, had become quite a problem because her seizures caused additional damage and she was having a lot of them. When students with special needs do their six years, the typical grades 7 through 12, they graduate with their class but then they're allowed to stay on at U32 in a program called Transition Academy. And it's been really a great way for her to sort of transition into adulthood. She's an adult. She's, she'll turn 22 um, this month in December. And at that time, she will no longer be able to attend Transition Acad Academy at U32, which means also that um, there will be no transportation for her power chair. So we're trying to raise funds to help Josie buy a lift van that has the capacity to move Georgia in her power chair. When I first met her, she was five, um, and she was just barely learning to walk. And she would... Um, to get her to first start to walk, she they put her in these ski boots and hooked her to skis, and they had her stand up so she could kind of get her stability that way. And then they took her out of there, and then she was just starting to hold on to furniture and kind of cruise around with the furniture at like age five and six. She just loved cruising around, or she lost her ability to walk. She had a long seizure. Usually her seizures have to be treated within... Um, you know, a minute or so, or they can cause kind of longer term effects. And there was one that was, she was in bed, it was before we had a seizure pad. And it was in this, we think she may have been seizing for like 15 or 20 minutes. And it, um, it gave her what's called Todd's paralysis, which is something that can happen after a long seizure. And um, she, it makes the whole one side of your body basically totally paralyzed. And this was when she had use of both her legs. And she was in the hospital for maybe five days after that. And we came home and she, even though she couldn't walk, she was still determined to get around the house. And she actually would flop herself from the couch onto the floor and she would shimmy across the floor with one arm and one leg to get over to get a book, to get whatever she wanted to do. And then she'd like shimmy back to the couch and then I'd have to lift her up and put her back on the couch. But it just shows you how determined that girl is. So when she was 11, she started falling more. And that's when they found out that she had um, some pockets in her spine, some fluid around her spine, um, from, probably from meningitis scarring that she had when she was a baby. And so that's when we took her um, down for the surgeries. And that's when we ended up in Spalding for the uh, four months. And Seeing her after those surgeries lose her mobility was um, probably one of the hardest things um, seeing with Georgia because she would, you know, right after the surgery, she would try to get out of bed and she wanted to do something in the hospital and she would, you know, try to stand up and she would start to fall and I would have to catch her and she just didn't understand why she couldn't walk. I remember before the hemispherectomy, one of the things they had to do to determine if the surgery was going to be effective at ending her seizures and if this procedure was safe to do was to map her brain. And so they actually took a piece of her skull off 
and put a big bandage on her head with a circle on the top of her head that said no bone and had electrodes on her brain and big monitors on the wall. And the monitors showed each section of her brain and when there was brain activity. So they needed to wait for each of her seizures and they needed to map where's her speech, where's her math, Where's her leg movement? Where's her arm movement? All these different functions so that they could determine if they could do the hemispherectomy, separate the two sides of her brain, help eliminate her seizures without a dramatic loss of function. Yeah, and with that time, I remember that I think it was like a week that we were trying to get her to have a seizure. Yeah, trying to keep her up and we would like stay up all night just you know, like I'd be feeding her chocolate pudding being like, Georgie, you can't go to sleep. You can't go to sleep. You got to stay up. You got to get a seizure. You got to get a seizure. But one of the things that happened with that is she finally had a seizure. And I looked over at the monitor and I could see kind of where, the, you know, it looked like the seizure was coming from. And we were happy. And then the next day they were going to take the electrodes off. And that's when we were trying to figure out if the hemispherectomy would work because we were trying to figure out which side of the brain the seizures were coming from. But what happened is that something happened with the machine and it never recorded the seizure. <laughs> we were so angry. We were so upset. I was like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding. We just spent a week doing this. You know, George is sitting here with part of her skull off. And the luckily I looked over and at the monitor and they had me because they had a video of us. And so they had me saying, wait a minute, look, the seizure is coming from the upper left part of the screen. And so they ended up using that because they had no recording of it at all. It was, it was unbelievable. In Boston, she works so hard in the physical therapy twice a day, the OT twice a day. She had a body brace, she had a leg brace. She, I mean, she was determined to walk again. And so, it was really, really hard seeing her lose that independence. And you could just see with her mood and depression kind of coming on with her losing that independence. And I just, I remember the, when she got her purple wheelchair, the one that was fitted to her correctly and her being able to move around the house a little bit more independently than the push chair um, that she first came home with. That level of independence was huge. And then the step up between her purple push chair and her power chair is even more amazing and unbelievable. And, and that first time I remember with um, Sarah Pashby and seeing her get in that power chair, she just like, it was amazing her making turns, going down the halls and seeing the joy on her face, being able to, um, you know, cruise around on her own and have that independence again was, um, really, really amazing. Her, even the first time she ever sat in a power chair with me and just seeing her just perk up and then take off, you know, she was just so excited to explore in a way that she just wasn't able to. And I mean, as, as a human being, but as a physical therapist, that's, that's what it's all about. So when I was spending time with G, you know, sometimes we'd be able to coordinate Josie and I to like swap cars or something like that so that we could have the van, um, which was always a pretty big deal for Georgia to be able to take her power chair out in Montpelier or it was like a very exciting day when I would be able to do that with her. But on the days when we didn't have the van, she'd still really want to do something in the power chair. <laughs> I, I can't count the number of times that we were going to go do something and Georgia would say something and, and it would go like this, uh, Georgia would go something. And then somebody would say, what'd you say, Georgia? And speak up, Georgia, you, we can't hear you. And the end result would be power chair. <laughs> <laughs> she, she wanted her power chair and it wasn't always possible. I love to see Georgia empowered and in her power chair, it is, it is her embodiment of empowerment. I just have memories we'd charge it up and she'd take it down the driveway and all the way up Apple Hill Road. And we'd go all the way around the loop. And G used to really 
push my limits in my physical strength because she'd just go as fast as she could. And I'd just be like sprinting behind her. It was like, it was such a free moment. Some of the most fun I saw her have was just being able to move. Her power chair has the ability to stand so she can be upright in her chair and moving. She loves to crank it up. Like (laughs) when we're outside and she's in a standing position and she can like speed it up to its full capacity. I mean, that there's nothing unhappy about that. (laughs) It's fun. (laughs) The nice thing with the having the power chair with her is that she can lead and not have to follow. And she does lead you. Uh, You give her that power chair and the controls and she's off and you're just trying to keep up with her. And it's fun whether you're going to the library or to the grocery store, she loves shopping or, um, you know, in your backyard. So I'm very excited about her ability to have that chair with her when she visits us and when she visits with her caregivers and when she's working in the community. And so, um, I mean, I knew she uses her power chair at school. We haven't been able to transport it back and forth because she has this new one now that doesn't fit into the van we have. Um, And it's also getting really difficult to lift her in and out of the car. And it's difficult for the caregivers to lift her in and out of the car. But um, at school, you know, they have the one that she can drive into and she can be buckled into the van in her chair, which has been awesome. So the caregivers don't have to lift her in and out. She has the independence of going in and out. You know, Georgia is this amazing, lively person when she's given the tools she needs. Well, her whole self is just different. You know, she goes from to, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a postural change. It's a cognitive change. It's an emotional change. Um, it's, it's a big deal just seeing her go through the halls at her high school and seeing her posture and the way she interacts and makes eye contact when she is controlling her own space is 180 degrees from her being pushed in her her, um, manual chair. At school, they run the coffee cart. And one of George's jobs and a few other um, kids with disabilities, they started this coffee cart with Deb, which is an awesome thing. And they sell coffee in the morning. And so Georgia always wanted me to stop. And so I finally, one day I stopped in and I hadn't seen her a lot at school um, with her power chair. And so I kind of came in and just sat back and observed for a little while. And it was so cool because so much of the time with her push chair, you know, me or the caregivers or whatever push her, since she only has one arm that works, she can't move herself on her own with her push chair. And so caregivers and me push her to certain places that we think she wants to be in certain groups. And she's, you know, maybe kind of quiet. So she just sits there and accepts it. But to sit back and see what she chose to do on her own. And she was actually, it amazed me. She was moving kind of from group to group of high schoolers. And she would kind of go up to them. And, you know, they may say, hi, Georgia. And she might not communicate a lot, but she would sit there and smile and listen to what they're saying. And then you'd see her kind of cruise to another and kind of listen. They'd be like, hi, Georgia. And they'd just accept her. And then she'd go back to the coffee cart and she'd, you know, sell more coffee and cookies. And and it was such an eye-opener of her independence and, like, what joy that brings to her. And the things that she would do that, you know, that I would, I would have never thought her pushed her up to all these different people. And it was, it was a really, really cool moment to see. And she's not always uh, willing to ask for the help. You know, she prefers to be able to do it herself. And so a lot of times she'll sit there and she won't have what she needs and wants um, because she's not going to bother somebody else to get it. And so it's really nice when she can get herself yeah. there. They all know her and love her in the library. She comes in and right away, you know, they're like, hi, Georgia, hi, Georgia, how are you doing today? So, um, and having her work there is, I mean, she's been working there throughout the school, but having her work there after is just going to be so fun for her. I'm just, I'm thinking of the Cal- bringing her to the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And on the days when I had the push chair and I'd bring it and get it out of my car and 
get her in and bring her to the library. And so I had to just kind of guess where she wanted to be. And I'd bring her some books and um, she would kind of start to glaze over though and clock out, uh, just not be as present. And I think for a while, I just kind of assumed that was her just getting tired or maybe too cold or something like that. I had the opportunity to bring her to the library in the power chair. And it was like such a different experience. She just zoomed around from bookshelf to bookshelf, looking at things and uh, just all of the, I mean, there's a lot to see <laughs> in the Kellogg Hubbard Library. So from the fish tank to the books, to the toys. Um, and it was just such a different experience and to see her level of engagement go way, way up and realize that when she was in her push chair, it was just not as, uh, engaging and yeah, that, that was part that of the reason that she was yeah. more glazed over more tired and having like even just I think the um, joystick responsibility really kicked it up a notch for her and it's just so cool to see I think I mean it really did improve the quality of her time at the library and so I could you know only imagine how much it's going to improve her overall quality of life to be able to do that all the time the the one hurdle to to making this transition is her being able to get around the community in a in a vehicle that will support this kind of a, a power mobility device one of the things that always bothered me with the old power chair in their current van is that it was way too heavy for that van and i always it for me it was a safety concern um you would see the 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 vehicle squat down when that 400 pound chair went in the back. So this side entry van would just, seems to me it would be wonderful because she could just, it would be the weight of the chair and Georgia would be in the proper place of the van. You know, for someone who has limits in speech communication, to depend on someone else to move you in every aspect of your life, you know, and then to see that ability to do it yourself is pretty incredible. Graduation was a real powerful thing to watch. And of her being able to come into graduation with her peers in a standing mode in her power chair. So she was at the same level as her peers. And then to get onto her walker and actually they, instead of having steps, they actually built a ramp for her to school. And so she was able with her walker and of course someone helping, she was able to walk up, get her diploma and walk back down. And um, the whole school had been, at least her whole class had been watching her work through this for a couple months and they were all behind it. They all kept it a secret from us. And so it was unbelievable. The entire gymnasium was, you know, standing and clapping for her. And um, I mean, I couldn't stop crying. It was just so amazing to see her have that independence and do that and how much it meant for her. The reaction I get when I tell people about Georgia, first introduce them to her um, and kind of tell them she's been in a wheelchair for quite a few years. Um, she's got, uh, peg tube, she had a hemispherectomy, and everyone's just kind of shell-shocked usually um, getting through all of that. And then meeting her, they're always just so amazed at how just happy she is and um, how fun she is and how much she enjoys doing things and how much she enjoys being um, social with people. And I think, I think people assume that, oh, this is a person who is completely nonverbal and just doesn't want to interact with anybody. Um, and that's absolutely not the case. And I think seeing her in her power chair in the community and being able to actually express all that interaction that she wants to do, um, it just absolutely amazes people, which is really cool. Um, and 
I mean, I think she's definitely an inspiration to a lot of people. And I think being able to have her in the community and people kind of knowing her story and what she's been through and how much she's able to do by herself is um, pretty powerful to a lot of people, I think. It is me. When I walk my dog, who's a huge, tall dog down the road, everybody stops and says hi to him. And the only thing that rivals that is walking with Georgia with her power chair. The amount of people that pull over on the side of the road to say hi, or going around the little roundabout in Montpelier and people who pull off to the side and completely stop traffic to say hi to Georgia is unbelievable. Bro, it's cold out here today. Having that independence to be able to go around town by herself um, and not put the physical strain on caregivers to try to push her over the bumpy sidewalks of Montpelier um, is huge. And she really does have a connection with the community here more than a lot of people, I think. Um, and giving her the ability to be still part of that community even when she's not in school is gonna be huge. And I mean, everybody that has cared for Georgia has really fallen in love with Georgia and they love being with her. She makes them as happy as they make her. I mean, it's a real, it's a real sweet relationships that she's uh, made with people. Uh, it is a, an act of love to work with Georgia. And Georgia has the same love to share back. And, you know, giving her that independence just allows her to give back a little bit more than she can otherwise. That it just gets very, cumbersome for people to have to lift her in and out of the car to try to, you know, if you bring her manual chair, it's, you know, it's a lot of work pushing her around places. Uh, she's not as happy doing that. It really does limit what she can do um, without it. And so I'm really excited to have her be able to have more mobility and have, you know, have her be able to go every place that we go. She really, I know that she loves it because she can be with the family and do what yeah. the family's doing. And uh, that's, that's the most important thing that she can, you know, do the things that the people around her are doing and be a real part of it. This, this is my own personal thing, but mobility is a human right, you know, and to, to, um, to make that human right as accessible as possible for someone with limited mobility. You know, I really do feel strongly that power mobility is, is the way to do it. And, um, you know, it's not just getting from point A to point B and we all, you know, we find ways we we're resilient. We, we, we make it work, but the ability to give that control back to another human being is huge. You know, she has so little control over her life. And I feel like um, having this little bit of independence where she can have a chair, where she can move herself around out in the community and with her caregivers um, just makes such a huge difference in her life.